For my thesis topic, I do a comparative analysis of the Greco-Roman civilizations in the United States. I do this because I realize that there are a lot of similarities between the civilizations. For instance, the United States had modeled a lot of our government structures off of the Greco-Romans. Uh, for instance, our models of democracy were inspired by uh, Athenian democracy, and our structures for the Republic were modeled off of uh, those of Rome. And the reason our founding fathers decided on democracy and a republic for our structure of government is because these civilizations had provided a lot of stability and a lot of prosperity during their uh, rise when they were at the pin pinnacle of the world. And they thought that they reflected um, the best opportunities uh, for liberty, for freedom, and for individuality. And what my paper uh, looks at is what made these nations so strong, why were they at the pinnacle of the world, and then it goes down through their history and we look at what brought them to their knees, what made these civilizations that once were the strongest, now the weakest. And we have Greece, which is very uh, minor in the world stage currently, and Rome, which is brought to now just the influence of a tourist spot as a city in Italy. And I decided on the title, Greco-Roman America, uh, the three names are instituted just for the representation that they are all similar, and that we as Americans took for the Romans, and the Romans took from the Greeks, and a lot of what we have government structure, philosophies, even architecture is very similar and inspired by that of Greece and Rome. And for the rest of the title, I uh, made it the rise and demise of the American Republic uh, because I've just noticed in recent his history that there is a lot of division within the United States. The integrity of the nation is in decline right now. Our national debt is atrocious and is almost irrepayable at the moment, and we are divided on nearly every aspect, you name it, whether it's morality, whether it's political, or whether it's just should pineapple be on a pizza. Um, there's division throughout all of it, and um, my paper is supposed to be looking if there is anything that the Greeks and the Romans can provide for us where we can learn these lessons, learn from the legacies of these once great superpowers of the world to fix our current situation that we're facing in the United States. And I do a chronology through the order, starting with the Hellenistic period of Greece and then transitioning from Greece to Rome. Uh, I noticed that the United States resembles the Greek city-states in its early beginnings before the United States was a sovereign nation. Um, when it was the colonies under the British rule. Uh, I noticed that it really reflected this loosely tied, there wasn't anything that really unified the colonies under this one flag until after the American Revolution. And even then, after the revolution, the new states were very divided. Uh, we weren't a unified whole until after the events of the Whiskey Rebellion where George Washington had come together, charged with his militia, with the uh, army, and brought these nations together and really solidified it. You really see the United States actually becoming united after the uh, presidency of George Washington. He realized that there was a duty he had to the nation. He didn't want to be president, but he realized that if he wasn't president during the time that the entire war uh, fought would have been in vain and everything that people sacrificed and suffered for would have just been all for nothing. And I do a comparative um, analysis with Washington and the leadership of Alexander the Great because the city-states of Greece weren't unified either. It wasn't until we had the leadership of the Macedonians um, after the Peloponnesian War and the entire Greco world was in shambles and they were too poor the Delian League and the Peloponnesian League. They didn't have the resources to lead Greece out of the turmoil uh, that occurred after 
after the Peloponnesian War and Macedon was the um, Greek city-state that was able to take Greece from the ashes and then Alexander the Great takes what his father did and brings it to a whole different level and what he institutes is this notion called the empire of the mind and this empire of the mind is one of the central themes throughout the research that I did. It ties in everything together because Alexander had influenced many world leaders after his death and it's because of Alexander that you see a lot of the decisions being made throughout Rome. Um, they were inspired. Uh, two of the greatest men that ever ruled Rome, uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, had been in awe of Alexander's legacy and they felt that they didn't measure up to the uh, legacy that he left so many other men. Um, and the empire of the mind is this notion that all of the cultures are going to be integrated, that we're working together, and the, the core glue that holds everything together of all these nations that he came and conquered um, in Egypt, India, Persia, and he's absorbing all of these different ethnicities and nationality together with this Greek overtone, and it's this Greek identity and glue that holds it all together but Alexander had respected all of the different cultures, traditions, and ethnicities, and he wanted to keep that together and expand on that and to make the world a more civilized, more knowledgeable and structured place. Um, and then we see that is something that the United States has really tried to do and is promoting currently, this idea of taking all these different ethnicities and accepting the diversity. We are a very diverse nation, um, but there's a very big difference with what Alexander was trying to promote through the empire of the mind. Uh, the United States does not have a strong American identity. It used to, um, early on uh, in the 20th century, uh, it was a lot easier to recognize the traits that made Americans American, and there was the this promise of this freedom, being oneself to choose for one's man. And uh, I think as a nation, we have forgotten what it means to be American. Many Americans currently do not know what are the unique traits that make them an American. Uh, the United States is more than welcome to inviting people of different cultures, countries, ethnicities, you name it, but there's no way or no national identity that uh, the people who we're taking in assimilate to. We say that they're more than welcome, but we're not willing to have them meet a standard. We're actually demanding citizens of our own uh, to assimilate to their cultures, to their ethnicity, and we're losing a national identity through this process. Um, as the paper continues on, I touch on the base of the unifying factors that the Romans used when they were integrating because integration helped them um, militarily. Uh, it added to the strength of their population. Uh, Rome was not built in a day um, and neither was the demise of Rome. It took a long process to get to the pinnacle of Roman culture and it also was a long process to see it reach its fall. And what the Romans did so well is they took in these people to make it a stronger nation, and what was expected of them is that when you were going to be a Roman citizen, that you would assimilate to Roman traditions, uh, and that you would have this recognizable trait that made you specifically Roman, and they said that you could respectively still hold on to your uh, traditions, to your ethnicity, um, which was truly monumental during the time, not even the Greeks allowed that. Citizenship um, was granted um, very broadly under the rule of Julius Caesar and under um, Augustus. Uh, the intention behind that was to gain popularity within the Senate and within uh, the population of Roman citizens, but it backfired for Julius Caesar, but Julius Caesar didn't care about 
um, his popularity within the Senate. All he cared about was the popularity among the Romans. And I do an analysis of Julius Caesar compared to Donald Trump just because of the reputation that Donald Trump has recently received from his political opponents. He is not liked in Washington. He is a very controversial figure, just as Julius Caesar was. But Donald Trump is not the contro controversial figure that we think he is in regards to him being a tyrant. Donald Trump is not a tyrant. He won the election by the rules, won the electoral vote, and obtained power that way. And Julius Caesar took power through militaristic means. Um, but I would like to point out that the political corruption that Rome faced and the United States currently faces is not within the executive authority of government. It was within the Senate taking matters into their own hands, and Rome has experienced that in several different levels with the uh, Gracchi brothers, with Gaius and Tiberius who were assassinated because the senators did not like the rhetoric that they were promoting and they didn't like the bills that they were promoting within the Senate and in order to eradicate them they had assassinated them and killed them and took matters into their own hands and even with Julius Caesar who actually expanded the um, responsibilities and authorities of the Senate. Um, he expanded it from 600 senators to 900 senators, and with 900 senators, there were only 60 that voted for the approval of the assassination of Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar was only stabbed 23 times. So you see a very small majority of the Senate taking matters into their own hands because they feel threatened by the presence of Julius Caesar, and they were the ones who had given Julius Caesar the authority of being dictator for 10 years, and a lot of the responsibility of the fall of Rome isn't actually on the leaders of Julius Caesar or the leaders of Alexander the Great. It's the failure of who came after them and took their legacy. It doesn't fall necessarily on just one man. And the problems of the United States don't just fall on Donald Trump. The problems the United States has been facing have been occurring for years. And we as a nation give more responsibility to the executive office and to who's running it than we do to who's in the legislative branch because it's not just one man that's responsible for the demise of the United States. It's the people who have been in leadership for 10 plus years and who continue to just reap the benefits of being in a political authoritative position. And they're the ones that are promoting the division within the United States. And if you look at it from a perspective without political um, propaganda, without the media promoting this division, it seems that Americans can get along very well. but they would have you believe otherwise, and unfortunately, it's the people who are in this position of authority that promote this divisiveness that is within the country, and they're the ones that promote what needs to be taught in education, what needs to be promoted traditionally, morally, ethnically, and it's very unfortunate because the Romans once had held strong traditional beliefs and the Greeks held this notion of a re and Greek excellence to help out their their brothers and their community and the American culture used to have that too but we've gone further away from that and now it's no longer about what you're doing for the community as a whole um, you know John F Kennedy once said that you know don't ask what uh, your country can do for you but what you can do for your country and the United States has moved very far from that. Um, but the good news is that the United States um, is not Greece or Rome. We are our own nation, we are our own civilization, and if it is, um, it is our responsibility, if we wanna change the future, it's up to us. We don't have to let um, History repeats itself. History repeats itself when you ignore history. Um, but it is up to the American people to decide the future of America.